I'm Dr Emily Mitchell and I work here in Cambridge in the Department of Zoology. I'm interested in understanding the origins and early evolution of animals. Now these are found in the Ediacaran time period around 600 million years ago and we know about them through the fossil record. But when we think about fossils, what we normally think about is things with bones, such as turtles, or things with shells, such as clams and brachiopods. But the first animals had yet to evolve the ability to make these hard parts, so they were entirely soft-bodied. Now, soft-bodied organisms are really difficult to preserve because in order to preserve them, they need to be killed really quickly, and they need to have nothing that's eaten them or scavenged or disturbed their bodies. But luckily, this is what we get in the Ediacaran. So because of volcanic ash flows that killed thousands upon thousands of organisms where they were living, rather like Pompeii, everything was captured as it was in life. And we can look at these exceptional bedding planes on the rock surface and have snapshots into these first animals. For my work, I need to do a lot of analyses of fossil specimens. Ideally, the more fossils, the better. So this requires collecting data out in the field, and in particular working in Newfoundland, Canada, on the coast, where you get hundreds of, of metres squares of rock surfaces covered in fossils. However, capturing this fossil data is rather hard because you need to capture very large areas, so hundreds of square metres, but you need to have it at such a resolution that you can actually identify the different species. And most of the methods that people normally use when doing field work, such as LIDAR, um, don't have the sort of resolution that we need to actually identify the species. So what I've been doing is developing new combinations of methods. So I use LIDAR to capture the large scale uh, rock surfaces, and then what's known as a laser line probe in order to capture the, the subtle details of the fossils. And so this laser line probe is mounted on a tripod um, and then a mechanical arm and pass the, the laser line probe over the fossil surface. And this doesn't damage the fossils in any way. The fossil surfaces are incredibly protected. Um, in fact, one of the main sites is a uh, mistaken point is a UNESCO World Heritage Site because of its importance to understanding the evolution of life on Earth. So you have to be really careful with these fossils because we don't want to damage them in any way. Uh, so we need to take the tripod, the uh, mechanical arm and the laser um, out to these fossil sites along with uh, a petrol generator so they can get power, as well as a rather large laptop that's powerful enough to process the data. We're interested in the history of evolution of animals through time. And one of the biggest questions within that is the evolution of animals themselves. When did they evolve and originate? And my research is into that particular question and focuses on an interval of time in two geological periods that we call the Ediacaran and Cambrian periods. And this covers a range of time around 550 million years ago. So this is a long running question because we have a huge amount of diversity of animals on Earth today. Everything from sponges very, and jellyfish, the very primitive sort of organisms, to things like ourselves, giraffes, whales, fish, insects. All of these are animals and they're all very different in terms of their shape and size and their activities and their lifestyles and habitats. So where did all of that diversity originate? Traditionally, for a long period of time, until the sort of 1900s, it was thought that the animal fossil record began in the Cambrian period. And this was termed by several scientists as the Cambrian explosion of life, the seemingly abrupt and dramatic appearance of animals in a fossil record, where previously there hadn't been any evidence for animal life whatsoever. And in the Cambrian, this fossil record, it contains things like small shelly fossils, um, tiny things related to mollusks and snails, um, various worm-like taxa leaving traces of their movement on the seafloor. But before that, there hadn't been very much of a fossil record at all. And then in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, people started to find impressions of organisms on sediments that were older than the Cambrian. And gradually, that field of research into that particular time interval has expanded and we now have what's called the Ediacaran period, which encompasses all of those different finds and reveals this very early stage of animal evolution. 
And one of my main interests has been what we refer to as the Cambrian explosion, which was something recognised by Darwin, uh, but is the apparently abrupt appearance of many of the major groups of animals. But we know, and have known for many years, that before that there is a preceding interval by some millions of years known as the Ediacaran assemblages. And I've published a little bit about that. But in a copy of the Biological Reviews in the early 60s, there was a landmark paper by a man called Martin Gleisner. And the point about Martin is that I had the great privilege of meeting him in Adelaide. But he wasn't Australian, he was actually from Austria. And his history is very remarkable because he was originally an oil geologist and had gone to Soviet Russia, but then during the Second World War had been abruptly, with many others, expelled by Stalin. And so <clears throat> in the end, he ended up in Australia. And he was a micropaleontologist, but news of these very remarkable discoveries in the Flinders Ranges, mostly by a man called Reg Sprigg, uh, fired Glaser's interest. And in this way, he wrote this paper, which suggested by and large that these were early animals. Now, an interesting thing about science is the way things don't go necessarily full circle, but in any event, change as the evidence moves on. And for a number of years, this was widely accepted, but then more recently, there was um, doubt, if you like, partly on the work of a German paleontologist called Adolf Seilacher. And they might be completely new groups of organisms, but things turn almost full circle. And now the consensus is beginning to suggest that indeed, as Gleisner suggested, these Ediacaran fossils are amongst the oldest of the known animals. Now, why do things change? Well, scientific evidence improves, but other lines of evidence such as molecular biology and geochemistry contribute to this discussion. And so it is that I feel immensely lucky to have been the president of the Cambridge Philosophical Society, but also to have met Martin Gleisner. So in terms of looking around the world at different uh, locations where these Ediacaran fossils are found. The main sites are in Newfoundland in Canada, uh, the White Sea region of Russia and South Australia in what's called the Flinders Ranges. And there's various papers on the Flinders Ranges dating back to the 1940s. But one that's quite prominent uh, was by Martin Gleisner in the 1960s and was published in the Cambridge Philosophical Society's Biological Reviews Journal. And that describes a whole range of these different organisms that have been recently described and try to interpret what they are. And we have here in the collections for teaching in the Earth Sciences Department a variety of uh, casts of those specimens. So, for example, here we've got something called Arborea. If you remember, uh, many of these things can be quite leaf-like in their morphologies and in their shape. And so this is a similar leaf-like form. And so here you have that leaf-like uh, part of the organism. And then you have a stem coming down through here, but that stem continues all the way up to the top of the organism. And in recent years, what we've found, some work with one of my former PhD students, is that if we look closely at that stem, there's a series of lines and tubes that have been preserved within it, that as they run up, they, they branch off and connect on this one-to-one -one relationship with each of the side branches coming off this frond. And what that tells us is that this is a, what we call a fascicled arrangement, and it's something you find quite commonly in clonal organisms, where each individual branch is host to a series of individual units. Um, in a coral, they would be called polyps, for example, or zooids in a bryozoan today. But this is something found throughout a variety of different animal groups, and it suggests that this might have been a colonial organism. So we're still finding new um, bits of anatomy and new discoveries in the morphology of these organisms, even today. Other fossils that Leisner described include things like uh, Sprigina. So this is another of the Australian fossils from the Flinders Ranges. This one is a little bit more like the trilobites from the Cambrian period that eventually um, come into play a little bit later, maybe 10 million years later in Earth history in that it does seem to have a head end to it. But there's no evidence yet of limbs, um, of legs or anything like that. There's no evidence of um, anatomy like eyes or a mouth even. All we have is a segmented body that sort of tapers towards the end of the organism. Gleisner thought this might be some type of worm, 
this is still one of the more puzzling of Ediacaran organisms, and we're not entirely sure yet where it fits in the tree of life. Other organisms we can be a little bit more confident about. So this very small one here is something called Kimberella, and it's a tiny oval-shaped organism, and it has a fringe around the edge of it, and what seems to be this dimpled, um, pitted structure in the middle. And so these are all preserved on the bottoms of sandstone beds. This is a, a replica cast, as many of these are. And so what we're seeing is an impression squashed of the top of the organism. And so that depression that we see here with the dimples is actually more likely to be some sort of soft shell sitting on top of the organism and has led to the suggestion by other authors that this might be something similar to a mollusk that's alive today. And then finally, one of Gleisner's most famous fossils, or almost iconic in South Australian paleontology, is something called Dickinsonia. And so that's an example of a Dickinsonia here, another cast specimen. And you can see that it's a very flat, sheet-like organism, which is divided up into these units. Um, around a central midline. And there's been a lot of recent work on this, some papers from Australia showing that these organisms were capable of moving, and that's evidenced by trackways that run behind some of the fossil specimens. Evidence from Russian uh, specimens and locations where we can actually work out which end all of these new units were added, and therefore that this was the back end of the organism compared to the direction it was moving. And so that's a similar mode of growth to modern bilaterian animals. Um, so the group that has any organism within it, including mollusks or um, ourselves, vertebrates, anything with bilateral symmetry through it. It suggests quite strongly that Dickinsonia may be closely related to those bilaterian organisms. So again, as with many of these other Ediacaran fossils, although we can't assign them to a distinct phyla yet, progress is being made in gradually moving them up into the higher branches of the animal tree of life. And that's sort of the, the expectation, given that in the Cambrian we have representatives of maybe 30 different phyla now, all the way through the Cambrian fossil record. We would expect that that diversity has to come from somewhere. And the Ediacan period, the preceding 20 to 40 million years of Earth history, um, prior to the Cambrian, seems to be where all of these developments were taking place and where all of this different diversity was being developed by these different animal groups. So as paleontologists and evolutionary biologists, one of the key things we're interested in is understanding how different animals relate to each other. And this is commonly done using uh, phylogenetic trees or trees of life. And this is a way to describe how different animals are related to each other um, because different groups of animals form different branches on the, on the tree. Uh, so when we're thinking about the origins of animals, it's useful to, to try and think about what they were. So this is really, really different, difficult for Ediacaran organisms because they look unlike anything else in the fossil record or even alive today. Now, while they look superficially like algae or plants, because they're found in, in deep water rocks, we know they couldn't have been photosynthetic, so we know this is not what they were. And actually, their body plans and anatomies are so strange. For, for decades, we really weren't sure what they were at all. And many different groups have been suggested, pretty much all of them. So sponges, cnidarians like, like corals, algae, uh, fungi, and even a now extinct kingdom. The idea was that Ediacaran organisms came into life as the first experiment in large complex life, but then died out, uh, leaving, leaving, uh, paving the way for animals to rise in the Cambrian. But we know now that this isn't the case. So due to recent analyses by Dr. Frankie Dunn in Oxford, who studied how different rangimorphs, these really early Ediacaran organisms, grew and developed, we know that they were, in fact, what's known as stem group eumetazoans. So that's, they are some of the first animals on that tree of life. So they're not sponges, they're not lidarians, they're something that came before that. <laughs>